All right. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, we're going to read chapter 11 of the book Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola and George Barna. This chapter is labeled Reapproaching the New Testament. The Bible is not a jigsaw puzzle. In handling the subject of ministry in the New Testament, it is essential to remember the order in which the books of the New Testament were written. If we assume as the order in which the books of the New Testament are now presented would lead us to assume that the Gospels were written first and then Acts and then the letters of Paul beginning with Romans and ending with the pastoral epistles to Timothy, to Titus, and the letter to Philemon. We shall never be able to understand the development of the institutions and the thought of the early church. Richard Hansen, 20th century patriotic scholar. In the last 50 or 100 years, the New Testament research, New Testament research has unremittingly and successfully addressed itself to the task of elucidating for us what is known as the ecclesia. In, the, in primitive Christianity. So di very different from what it what is today called the church, both in Roman Protestant camps and Protestant camps. This, this insight, which an unprejudiced study of the New Testament and the crying need of the church have helped us to reach, may be expressed as follows. The New Testament Ecclesia... The fellowship of Jesus Christ is a pure communion of persons and has nothing to do with the character of an institution about it. It is therefore misleading to identify any single one of the historical developed churches, which are all marked by an institutional character, with the true Christian communion. Emil Bruner, 20th century Swiss theologian. Why is it that we Christians can follow the same rituals every Sunday without ever noticing that they are at odds with the New Testament? The incredible, incredible power of tradition has something to do with it. As we have seen, the church has often been influenced by the surrounding culture, seemingly unaware of its negative effects. At other times, it has quite properly recognized overt threats, such as heretical teachings about the person and divinity of Jesus Christ. But in an effort to combat those threats, it has moved away from the organic structure that God wrote into the church's DNA. But there is something else, something more fundamental that most Christians are completely unaware of. It concerns our New Testament. The problem is not in what the New Testament says, the problem is in how we approach it. The approach most commonly used among contemporary Christians when studying the Bible is called proof texting. The origin of proof texting goes back to the late 1590s. A group of men called Protestant scholastics took the teachings of the reformers and systematized them according to the rules of Aristotelian logic. The Protestant scholastics held that not only is the scripture the word of God, but every part of it is the word of God in and of itself, irrespective of context. And that is not true. It must be used in context. This set the stage for the idea that if we lift a verse out of the Bible, all by itself, it is true in, and o in, and in its own right and can be used to prove a doctrine or a practice. When John Nelson Darby emerged in the mid-1800s, he built a theology based on this approach. Darby raised proof texting to an art form. In fact, it was Darby who gave fundamentalist and evangelical Christians a good deal of their presently accepted teachings. All of them are built on the proof texting method. Proof texting then became the common way that we contemporary Christians approach the Bible. And I, I will uh, put in there, jump in here for a second and, and let you know that John Nelson Darby 
came up with the idea. His is uh, most Christians believe in Darbyism and don't even know it. They believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and they believe in pre-millennial or uh, in in uh, in uh, a millennial reign after Christ comes back. And those are all things added in the 1850s by by John Nelson Darby. All right, let's continue. As a result, we Christians rarely, if ever, get to see the New Testament as a whole. Rather, we are served up a dish of fragmented thoughts that are drawn together by means of fallen human logic. The fruit of this approach is that we have strayed far afield from the principles of the New Testament church, yet we still believe we are being biblical. Allow us to illustrate the problem with a fictitious story. Meet Marvin Snurdly. Marvin Snurdly is a world-renowned uh, marital counselor. In his 20-year career as a marriage therapist, Marvin has counseled thousands of troubled couples. He has an internet presence. Each day, hundreds of couples write letters to Marvin about their marital sob stories. The letters come from all over the globe, and Marvin answers them all. A hundred years pass. And Marvin Snurdly is resting peacefully in his grave. He has a great-great-grandson named Fielding Mellish. Fielding decides to recover the lost letters of his great-great-grandfather. But Fielding can only find 13 of Marvin's letters. Out of the thousands of letters that Marvin wrote in his lifetime, just 13 have survived. Nine were written to couples in marital crisis. Four were written to individual spouses. These letters were all written within a 20-year time frame, from 1980 to 2000. Fielding Mellish plans to compile these letters into a volume, but there is something interesting about the way Marvin wrote his letters that makes Fielding's task somewhat difficult. First, Marvin had an annoying habit of never dating his letters. No days, months, or years appear on any of the 13 letters. Second, the letters only portray half the conversation. The initial letters written to Marvin that provoked his responses no longer exist. Consequently, the only way to understand the backdrop of each of Marvin's letters is by reconstructing the marital situation from Marvin's response. Each letter was written at a different time to people in a different culture about a different problem. For example, in 1985, Marvin wrote a letter to Paul and Sally from Virginia who were experiencing sexual problems early in their marriage. In 1990, Marvin wrote a letter to Jethro and Matilda from Australia who were having problems with their children. In 1995, Marvin wrote a letter to, to a wife from Mexico who was experiencing a midlife crisis. Unfortunately, Fielding has no way of knowing when the letters were written. Take note, 20 years, 13 letters, all written to different people at different times in different cultures, all experiencing different problems. It is Fielding Mellish's desire to put these 13 letters in chronological order. But without the dates, he cannot do this. So Fielding puts them in the order of descending length. That is, he takes the longest letter that Marvin wrote and puts it first. He puts Marvis, Marvin's second longest letter after that. He takes the third longest letter and puts it third. The compilation ends with the shortest letter that Marvin penned. The 13 letters are arranged, not chronologically, but by their length. The volume hits the press and becomes an overnight bestseller. 100 years pass, and the collected works of Marvin Snurdly compiled by Feeling Mellish stands the test of time. The work is still very popular. Another 100 years pass, and this volume is being used copiously throughout the Western world. The book is translated into dozens of languages. 
Marriage counselors quote it left and right. Universities employ it in their social, sociology classes. It is so widely used that someone gets a bright idea on how to make the volume easier to quote and handle. What is that idea? It is to divide Marvin's letters into chapters and numbered, numbered sentences or verses. So chapters and verses are added to the collected works of Marvin Snurdly. But by adding chapters and verses to these once living letters, something changes that, get, that goes unnoticed. The letters lose their personal touch. Instead, they take on the texture of a manual. Different sociologists begin writing books about marriage and the family. Their main source, the collected works of Marvin Snurdly. Pick up any book in the 24th century on the subject of marriage and you will find the author quoting chapters and verses from Marvin's letters. It usually looks like this. In making a particular point, the author will quote a verse from Marvin's letter written to Paul and Sally. The author will then lift another verse from the letter written to Jethro and Matilda. He will extract another verse from another letter. Then he will sew these three verses together, and upon them he will build his particular marital philosophy. Virtually every sociologist and marital therapist that authors a book on marriage does the same thing. Yet the irony is this, each of these authors frequently contradicts the others, even though they are all using the same source. But that is not all. Not only have Marvin's letters been turned into cold prose when they were originally living, breathing epistles to real people in real places, they have become a weapon in the hands of, of agenda-driven men. Not a few authors on marriage begin employing isolated proof texts from Marvin's work to hammer away at those who disagree with their mar marital philosophy. How is this possible? How are all of these sociologists contradicting each other when they are using the exact same source? It is because the letters have been lifted out of their historical context. Each letter has been plucked from its chronological sequence and removed from its real-life setting. Put another way, the letters of Marvin Snurdly have been transformed into a series of isolated, disjointed, fragmented sentences. So anyone can lift one sentence from one letter, another sentence from another letter, and then paste them together to create the marital philosophy of his or her choice. An amazing story, is it not? Well, here's the punchline. Whether you realize it or not, this is the description of your New Testament. The order of Paul's letters. The New Testament is made up mostly of the Apostle Paul's letters. In fact, he wrote two-thirds of it. He penned 13 letters in about a 20-year time span. Nine letters were written to churches in different cultures at different times, experiencing different problems. Four letters were written to individual Christians. The people who received those letters were also dealing with different issues at different times. Take note, 20 years, 13 letters, all written to different people at different times in different cultures, all experiencing different problems. In the early 2nd century, someone began to take the letters of Paul and compile them into a volume. The technical term for this volume is canon. Scholars refer to this compiled volume as the Pauline canon. The New Testament is essentially this compilation, with a few letters added after it. The four Gospels and Acts placed before it, and Revelation tacked onto the very end. At the time, no one knew when Paul's letters were written. Even if they had, it would not have mattered. There was no precedent for alphabetical or chronological ordering. The first century Greco-Roman world, Greco world 
ordered its literature according to decreasing length. Look at how your New Testament is arranged. What do you find? Paul's longest letter appears first. It is Romans. 1 Corinthians, the second longest letter, so it follows Romans. 2 Corinthians is the third longest letter. Your New Testament follows this pattern until you come to that tiny little book called Philemon. In 1864, Thomas D. Bernard delivered a series of talks as part of the Bampton Lectures. These lectures were published in 1872 in a book entitled The Progress of Doctrine in the New Testament. In the book, Bernard argued that the present order of Paul's letters in the New Testament was divinely inspired and commended. This book became very popular among Bible teachers in the 19th and 20th centuries. As a result, virtually every theological text, exegetical text, or biblical commentary written in the 19th and 20th centuries follows the present chaotic order which blinds us from seeing the entire panoramic view of the New Testament. Canon, canonical criticism is big among seminarians. This is the study of the canon as a unit in order to acquire an overall biblical theology. What is needed today is a theolo theology built not on the present canon and its misarrangement, but on the chronological narrative of the New Testament church. Here is the present order as it appears in your New Testament. The books are arranged according to descending length. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. What then is the proper chronological order of these letters? According to the best available scholarship, here is the order in which they were written. Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Corinthians and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, Philippians, 1st Timothy, Titus, and then 2nd Timothy. The addition of chapters and verses. In the year 1227, a professor at the University of Paris named Stephen Langton added chapters to all the books of the Bible. Then in 1551, a printer named Robert Stephanus, sometimes called Robert Estine, numbered the sentences in all the books of the New Testament. According to Stephanus' son, the verse divisions that his father created do not do service to the sense of the text. Stephanus did not use any consistent method. While riding on horseback from Paris to Lyons, he versified the entire New Testament within Langton's chapter divisions. You hear that? He was just riding on horseback going from, going from Paris to Lyons. And he added verses. Hmm. So verses were born in the pages of Holy Writ in the year 1551. And since that time, God's people have approached the New Testament with scissors and glue, cutting and pasting isolated, disjointed sentences from different letters, lifting them out of their real-life setting, lashing them together to build floatable doctrines, and then calling it the Word of God. Seminarians and Bible college students alike are rarely, if ever, given a panoramic view of the free-flowing story of the early church, with the New Testament books arranged in chronological order. As a result, most Christians are completely out of touch with the social and historic events that lay behind each of the New Testament letters. Instead, they have turned the New Testament into a manual that can be wielded to prove any point. Let me repeat that. Instead, they have turned the New Testament into a manual that can be wielded to prove any point. Chopping the Bible up into fragments makes, makes this relatively easy to pull off. How we approach the New Testament. We Christians have been taught to approach the Bible in one of eight ways. You look for verses that inspire you, 
Upon finding such verses, you either highlight, memorize, meditate upon, or put them on your refrigerator door. You look for verses that tell you what God has promised so that you can confess it in faith and thereby obligate the Lord to do what you want. You look for verses that tell you what God commands you to do. You look for verses that you can quote to scare the devil out of his wits or resist him in the hour of temptation. You look for verses that will prove your particular doctrine so that you can slice and dice your theological sparring partner into rip biblical ribbons. Because of the proof texting method, a vast wasteland of Christianity behaves as if the mere citation of some random decontextualized verse of scripture ends all discussion on virtually any subject. You look for verses in the Bible to control and or correct others. You look for verses that preach well and make good sermon material. This is an ongoing addiction for many who preach and teach. You sometimes close your eyes, flip open the Bible randomly, stick your finger on a page, read what the text says, and then take what you have read as a personal word from the Lord. Now look at this list again. Which of these approaches have you used? <laughs> I'm guilty. Look again. Notice how each is highly individualistic. All of them put you, the individual Christian, at the center. Each approach ignores the fact that most of the New Testament was written to corporate bodies of people, not individuals. But that is not all. Each of these approaches is built on isolated proof texting. Each treats the New Testament like a manual and, and blinds us to the real message, its real message. It is no wonder that we can, uh, can approvingly nod our heads at paid pastors, the Sunday morning order of worship, sermons, church buildings, religious dress, choirs, worship teams, seminaries, and a passive priesthood, all without wincing. We have been taught to approach the Bible like a jigsaw puzzle. Most of us have never been told the entire story that lies behind the letters that Paul, Peter, James, John, and Jude wrote. We have been taught chapters and verses, not the historical context. For instance, have you ever been given the story behind Paul's letter to the Galatians? Before nodding, see if you can answer these questions off the top of your head. Well, who were the Galatians? What were their issues? When and why did Paul write to them? What happened just before Paul penned his Galatian treatise? Where was he when he wrote it? What provoked him to write the letter? And where in Acts do you find the historical context for this letter? All of these background matters are indispensable for understanding what our New Testament is about. Without them, we simply cannot understand the Bible clearly or properly. And I'm going to add in, if you don't understand the first centuries, the Jews, euphemisms, metaphors, similes, and things like that, and the way they used words, then you'll never understand it either. One scholar put it this way, the arrangement of the letters of Paul in the New Testament is in general that of their length. When we rearrange them into their chronological order, fitting them as far as possible into their life setting within the record of the Acts of the Apostles, they begin to yield up more of their treasure. They become self-explanatory to a greater extent than when this background is ignored. Another writer, another writes, if future editions of the New Testament want to aid rather than hinder a reader's understanding of the New Testament, it should be realized that the time is right to cause both the verse and chapter divisions to disappear from the text and to be put on the margin as an, as in as an inconspicuous a place as possible. 
every effort must be made to print the text in a way which makes it possible for the units which the author himself had in mind to become apparent. You could call our method of studying the New Testament the clipboard approach. If you are familiar with computers, you are aware of the clipboard component. If you happen to be in a word processor, you may cut and paste a piece of text via the clipboard. The clipboard allows you to cut a sentence from one document and paste it into another. Pastors, seminarians, and laymen alike have been conditioned by the clipboard approach when studying the Bible. This is how we justify our man-made and case traditions and pass them off as biblical. It is why we routinely miss what the early church was like whenever we open our New Testaments. We see verses. We do not see the whole picture. This approach is still alive and well today, not only in the institutional churches, but in house churches as well. Let me use another illustration to show how easily anyone can fall into it and the harmful effects it can have. Meet Joe House Church. Joe House Church grew up in the institutional church. For the last 10 years, he has been dissatisfied with it. Yet he has a heart for God and sincerely wants to be used by him. When Joe picks up a book on house churches, he has a crisis of conscience. He ends up learning some amazing things. Namely, that there is no contemporary pastor in the New Testament. There are no church buildings. There is no paid clergy. And church meetings are open for all to share. All of these discoveries rock Joe's world, so much so that he leaves the institutional church. After facing the fury of the pastor, by the way, you see, Joe makes the mistake. I don't think it was a mistake. You're supposed to accept this fury whenever you come to the knowledge of truth. You're supposed to speak it forth. It says, you see, Joe made a mistake. He makes a mistake of sharing these great revelations with other people in his church. When the pastor gets wind of it, Joe finds himself in the pastor's crosshairs and is called a heretic. After licking his wounds... Joe picks up his New Testament, never realizing that the cut-and-paste approach still lives in his brain. The clipboard mentality was never extracted from his thinking, and he is blissfully unaware of it, as, most, as are most Christians. Joe begins looking for the ingredients to start a New Testament church, so he begins to do what most Christians are conditioned to do when seeking God's will. He cherry-picks verses out of the New Testament, ignoring the social and historical background of those verses. Joe comes across Matthew 18.20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Joe keeps reading and discovers Acts 2.46, that the early Christians regularly met in homes. Joe gets a revelation. All I have to do is open my house, have two or three people gather here, and, and, and voila, I have planted a New Testament church. So the next Sunday, Joe opens up his home and starts a house church based on the New Testament. So he thinks. Soon he has another revelation. I am a church planter like Paul. I started a church just like he did. Joe does not realize that he has just lifted two sentences from two documents completely out of historical context and sewn them together to do something that has no root in Scripture. Matthew 18.20 is not a recipe for founding a church. That passage is dealing with, the with an excommunication meeting. Acts 2.46 is simply a report of what the early Christians did. Yes, the early Christians met in homes, and it is highly recommended that we, that we meet in homes today. But opening up our home, one's home, and inviting people to meet there does not make a church nor does it make the owner of the home a church planter. The churches that were planted in the first century were planted out of blood and sweat. The people who planted them did not leave the synagogue on Saturday and decide they were going to plant a house church on Sunday. Every man in the New Testament who was involved in planting churches was first an ordinary brother in an already existing church. 
And in time, that man, after a lot of tribulation and exposure in a church that knew him very well, was recognized and sent with the approval of that church. This is a consistent pattern throughout the New Testament. You can, you can prove anything with verses. Birthing a church that maps to New Testament principles takes a whole lot more work than opening up your house and having people sit on comfy couches to drink java, eat cookies, and talk about the Bible. What do we mean by a New Testament-style church? It is a group of people who know how to experience Jesus Christ and express Him in a meeting without any human officiation. Such a group of people can function organically together as a body when they are left on their own after the church planter leaves them. This does not mean that the church planters never return. There are many times when they are needed to help the church. But after planting, a church planters should be absent more than they are present. The one who plants a New Testament style church leaves that church without a pastor, elders, a music leader, a Bible facilitator, or a Bible teacher. If that church is planted well, those believers will know how to sense and follow the living, breathing headship of Jesus Christ in a meeting. They will know how to let Him invisibly lead their gatherings. They will bring their own songs. They will write their own songs. They will minister out of what Christ has shown them with no human leader present. What is described here is not armchair philosophy. I, Frank, have worked with churches that fit this bill. To equip people to do what to equip people to do that takes a lot more than opening up your house and saying, "Come, let's have a Bible study." Let's go back to our story. Joe House Church now has what he considers a New Testament church. As in all small groups like Joe's, the, how, the issue of leadership is raised. What, do, what does Joe do? He gets his cherry picker out and begins looking for verses on leadership. He stops at Acts 14 and is arrested by verse 23. It says, Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church. Joe gets in another revelation. The word of God declares that every New Testament church has elders. He muses. Therefore, our house church needs elders. Joe makes this discovery only two weeks after opening up his house. After lifting that verse out of context, Joe appoints elders. Joe happens to be one of those elders, by the way. What is the historical context of Acts 14? Two church planters, Paul and Barnabas, are sent out of their home church in Antioch. Before this sending, both men had already experienced church life as brothers not leaders, Barnabas in Jerusalem and Paul in Antioch. Acts 14.23 is part of a description of what took place after these two church planters were sent out. They are in South Galatia. The two men have just planted four churches. Now they are returning to visit those churches six months to one year after those churches were planted. Paul and Barnabas return to each of the Galatian churches and publicly endorse old men in each church. Joe has made another more subtle mistake while interpreting this passage. The verse says that Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in every church. Joe take this, takes this to mean that every genuine church has elders. Yet this text says no such thing. The verse is referring to an event in South Galatia during the first century. Every church means every church in South Galatia in AD 49. Luke is talking about the four churches that Paul and Barnabas planted. Do you see the problem that we run into when we blithely lift verses from their historical setting? The truth is, Joe House Church is totally outside of biblical bounds. First, he is not an itinerant church planter. These are the men who acknowledged elders in the first century. Second, his church is far too young to have elders. In Jerusalem, it took at least 14 years for elders to emerge. But Joe House Church has his verse, so he is standing on Scripture in his imagination. Later, the issue of giving money comes up. So Joe parks at 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. 
on the first day of the week, you should put up aside a portion of the money you have earned. Based on this verse, Joe institutes a rule that everyone in his house church should give money to the church fund on Sunday morning. Again, Joe has taken a passage out of context and built a practice upon it. 1 Corinthians 16.2 is dealing with a one-time request. It was written about A.D. 55 to the church in Corinth. At the time, Paul was collecting money from all the Gentile churches that he had planted. Paul had one goal for this. He wanted to bring that collection to the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who were going through severe poverty. Paul was saying to the Corinthians, By the way, when I come and visit, I want that money up front to bring to Jerusalem. So every Sunday when you come together, would you please gradually lay aside a portion of your earnings to create a relief fund? 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 therefore has nothing to do with a perfunctory ritual of taking up an offering every Sunday morning. Perfunctory means required. Next, Joe's house church begins to discuss the question of the church's mission. Naturally, Joe takes out his cherry picker and seeks verses that will yield an answer. He stops at Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He cross-references this to Mark 16, 15, which says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. It continues on to Acts 42. They cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Joe muses to himself, Our mission is to preach the gospel. That is why we exist. Why shucks, if God did not want us to preach the gospel, he would have killed us after we got saved. So the only reason we have to breathe oxygen, the only reason why we have house churches is to preach the gospel. This is what the New Testament says. I just read it. And if we don't preach the gospel regularly, then we are sinning against God. Once again, Mr. Joe House Church has lifted three verses totally out of context. In Matthew 28, 19 and Mark 16, 15, Jesus is sending his apostles. And in Acts 5, 42, these same apostles are preaching the gospel. In the original Greek, the Great Commission reads, Having gone on your way, therefore it is a prophecy, having gone, not a command, go. The Lord did not command the apostles to go. He told them that they would be going. There is a valuable point here. Unlike Christians today, the early Christians did not share Christ out of guilt, command, or duty. They sheer, shared him because he was pouring out of them, and they could not help it. It was a spontaneous, organic thing, born out of life, not guilt. Joe's thought process about the church's mission have been shaped by two things. 19th century revivalism, see chapter 3, and the clipboard approach to the Bible. The net effect of the clipboard approach. Let's step back and analyze Joe's story. Joe has grossly mishandled the New Testament. Is his motive pure? Yes. Does he have a heart for God? Yes. Did this keep him from misapplying Scripture? No. Joe has come to the New Testament as many of us were taught to do with scissors and glue, ready to cut and paste and create a basis for our favorite doctrines and practices. The net effect of the clipboard approach is tragic. It has produced a raft of present-day churches that have no scriptural basis upon which to exist. We speak of the institutional church as we know it today. But more, it has generated scores of mechanical pro forma house churches that are lifeless, colorless, and sterile. Recall the vision that Ezekiel had of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 3, 37. The Lord took Ezekiel to a valley of bones. And the living, breathing word of God came forth to re resurrect those bones. The scripture says that bone was put upon bone 
the bones were clothed with sinew and flesh, and when the breath of God came into them like a rush, like a rushing wind, those dead bones became a mighty army. Many contemporary house church planters can be described as men who have come to the valley of dry bones with glue, needle, thread, and a New Testament verse in hand and New Testament verses in hand. They have taken the bones and glued them together. They have put thread through the sinew and stitched flesh upon it. Upon it, they have stood back and said, "Look, a New Testament church built on New Testament on the New Testament. We have elders. We meet in a house. We do not have a hired clergy. We take up a collection every Sunday and we preach the gospel. But there is no rushing mighty wind." The church of Jesus Christ cannot be started. It cannot be welded together. There is no blueprint or model that we can tease out of the New Testament by extracting verses and trying to imitate them to imitate them mechanically. The church of Jesus Christ is a biological living entity. It is organic. Therefore it must be born we do well to pay attention to the way that churches were raised up in the first century. I believe that Scripture holds for us enduring principles on this score. If you count all the churches mentioned in the New Testament, you'll find about 35. Every one of them was either planted or aided by a traveling church planter who preached only Christ. There are no exceptions. The church was raised up as a result of the apostolic presentation of Jesus Christ. There are more verses to back this principle up than there are for meeting in homes. There are more verses to back that up than there are for open participatory meetings. There are more verses to back that up than there are for taking up collection on Sunday morning. The book of Acts is a record of churches being planted by extra local workers in Judea, South Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, Asia Minor, and Rome. The epistles are letters written by apostolic workers to churches in crisis, to individuals, and to those they were training for spiritual ministry. The principle of the extra-local church planner dominates the New Testament. And as we have seen, there is much more scripture to support this practice than there is for all the unscriptural things we do in the contemporary church, including hiring a pastor. The pattern of extra-local worker, workers planting and helping a church pervades the entire New Testament, and it is one that is deeply rooted in divine principle. A practical remedy. What, then, is the antidote to the clipboard approach to the New Testament? What is the remedy that will bring you into a living expression of the body of Christ for our time? The antidote begins with understanding our New Testament. We have been conditioned to come to the New Testament with a microscope and extract verses to find out what the early Christians did. We need to abandon that whole mentality, step back and take a fresh look at the scriptures. We must become familiar with the whole sweeping drama from beginning to end. We need to learn to view the New Testament panoramically, not microscopically. I believe we need to look at it both ways, panoramically, microscopically, and microscopically. F.F. F. Bruce, one of the greatest scholars of our time, once made a riveting statement. He said, reading the letters of Paul is like listening to one end of a phone conversation. I agree. Thanks to recent biblical scholarship, we can now reconstruct the entire saga of the early church. In other words, we can hear the other side of the conversation. Frank's book, The Untold Story of the New Testament Church, reconstructs both sides of the conversation, creating one fluid narrative of the early church. To learn the st story of the early church is to be forever cured of the cut-and-paste, clipboard approach of the New Testament. Learning the story will lay bare the spiritual principles there that are in God Himself and that are consistent throughout all the New Testament. 
We can consistently miss these principles because of the way we approach the Bible and because Paul's letters are not arranged chronologically. When we learn the story, our verses must bow and bend to it. No longer are we able to take a verse out of context and say, Look, we are supposed to do this. Many of our verses, of the verses that we Christians routinely pull out of the Bible, will simply not yield. More significantly, approaching the Bible in this way enables us to see the passion and unity with which the first Christians lived as they sought to faithfully follow and present their Lord Jesus. And what was that passion? That is the question we turn to in the final chapter. Delving deeper. Are you saying it is always dangerous to handle Scripture topically, either in an individual study or while preparing to teach on some specific issue? Or do you think if Christians took the time to gain a panoramic understanding of Scripture, they could avoid the dangers of proof texting? Topical studies can easily lead one astray if the particular texts that are part of the topic are not understood in the historical context. For that reason, it is best to begin with the narrative of Scripture, seeing the whole fluid, sto whole fluid story in its historical context. Once that foundation is laid, topical studies can prove quite meaningful. Number two, is organic church a synonym for house church? If not, what is the distinction? No, it is not a synonym. Some house churches are organic, while others are not. A number of present-day house churches are glorified Bible studies. Many others are supper fests. The meeting revolves around a shared meal, and that is about it. Some house churches are just, institutionalized, just as institutionalized as traditional churches with a living room pulpit and chairs arranged, chairs arranged in rows so attendees can listen to a 45-minute sermon. Organic church life is a grassroots experience that is marked by face-to-face -face community, every member functioning, open to participatory meetings, non-hierarchical leadership, and the centrality and supremacy of Jesus Christ as the functional leader and the head of the group. Put another way, organic church life is the experience of the body of Christ. In its purest form, it is the fellowship of the triune God brought to earth and experienced by human beings. Number three, what are the signs of a healthy organic church? What are the signs of an unhealthy organic church? Some of the signs of a healthy organic church are the building together of sisters and brothers into a close-knit, Christ-centered community. The transformation of character in the lives of the members. Meetings that express and reveal Jesus Christ and in which every member functions and shares. Community life that is vibrant, thriving, authentic, and where the members grow to love one another more and more. A community of believers who are magnificently obsessed with their Lord and who are neither legalistic nor libertine in their lifestyle. The signs of an earthly organic church are similar to the problem. The, the signs of an unhealthy organic church are similar to the problems of the apostle pointed out to the church in Corinth. A perversion of the grace of God to be a license to sin a sectarian and elitist attitude, and self-centeredness among its members. Since organic churches are face-to-face -face communities, they experience the whole gambit of problems that Christians face in close-knit relationships. These problems are dealt with in Paul's letters. Healthy churches survive these problems and become stronger after passing through them. Unhealthy ones typically do not survive them. And that's the end of that chapter. We'll come back for the last chapter. I love you all, brothers and sisters. You have a blessed, wonderful day. Stay strong in the Lord. Jesus loves you.